um, we are going to look at communion. Communion. Officiating of the church ordinance is communion. What is communion? Let's look at the meaning. Just as Baptists observed as an entry or initiation rite, right? It is, you know, baptism is a entry rite, right? It is, it helps a believer to enter into the life of a local church, right? Enter into the membership of the local church, right? Uh, so it is, a, we call it this as an initiation rite. Whereas, and it also celebrates believers' union with Christ and his church. Yeah. Uh, baptism celebrates uh, not only union with Christ, you are united. It is a symbol of your unification, your union with Christ. Also, it is a symbol of your union with the local church, right? Not only that, you are identified, you are identified with his death. But you are also becoming part of a local church, right? You enter into the membership. That's what baptism. Lord's table, Lord's table, which is known as communion, or sometimes people call communion, serve as, serve as a continuation rite, not an initiation rite. Continuation rite in which believers perpetually re examine. And celebrate the communion that was established in baptism. All right? So, Lord's table, it is a continuation rite. It, is, it tells that you are continually, you are, you, are, you are a believer. It declares that you are a believer. Constantly declares that you are a believer. Constantly declares that you are in fellowship with a church, right? Fellowship with the church. So let's look at point number A here. Believer celebrates his continual individual union with Christ by identifying with his body, blood, and including the imputation of passive and active obedience of Christ. Right. So uh, you, in the Lord's table, you know, we say you remember. Not only simply remember, you actually celebrate, right? Lord's table is a time of celebration. Ce celebration of what? What do you celebrate? You celebrate your union with Christ, that you are joined with Christ, joined and identifying with his body and blood, right? Remember? Broken body and shed blood. Right? So you have bread and wine. Right? Bread and wine. Wine represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Bread represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. United together, this too represents the death of Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah. Broken body and shed blood represents the death of Jesus Christ. So understand that one. But here, what you do, you are, you are identifying his body and blood, including the imputation of passive and active obedience of Christ. So there are two obedience, right? One is passive, another is active. Remember, if you have not learned Christology, you may not understand what is passive obedience, active obedience. Active obedience is the obedience of Christ in, on this earth, 33 and a half years. Right? Christ obeyed the law fully and earned 
33 and a half years, he lived, he earned righteousness for us. Right? Jesus earned righteousness. The righteousness that comes from the law we need. Right? Because in order to go to heaven, we need two things, friends. What are the things we need? Number one, we need, we need our penalty to be paid. Penalty for our sin to be paid. Number two, we need righteousness of the law in order to go to heaven. Both things we cannot earn by ourselves. So Christ obeyed the law. So that is active obedience. And he earned righteousness for us. And that righteousness is imputed on us. Second, what is passive obedience? Passive obedience is the death of Jesus Christ. He gave himself to the hand of the Father to be punished for our sin. So that is passive obedience. So these are explained in Christology. So these are all part of Christ's work on our behalf. So what you need to understand, friends, yes, when you, send, when you partake in the Lord's table, yes, there you need to celebrate Christ's obedience, which is passive and active. There are a few verses. Remember, number one, take, this is from Matthew 26. Take it. This is my body. This is my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Remember, uh, this is a verse against Roman Catholics, right? Matthew 26. Uh, Roman Catholics and other groups who believes in the transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. Christ's blood becomes, sorry, the wine becomes blood. Right, that's what they believe. Right, it becomes original blood, and um, I don't know. Uh, there are sometimes people would say me a lot of things about all this kind of thing. So forget about what what others say. But Roman Catholics and many other churches believe in transubstantiation. Right, uh, the blood, the wine becomes blood. But look at here, Matthew 26. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, take it. This is my body. This is my blood. Question is to be asked. Did Jesus shed his blood here? No. Did Jesus maybe cut a piece of his body there and gave them? No. He gave them bread. He gave them wine. That's what he gave. But he said, this is my body. Actually, he was saying, this bread symbolizes, this bread symbolizes my body. This, this wine symbolizes my blood. Now, this is, this is he talking before his death. And you know, if you know Jewish people, if you really know Jewish people, Jewish people will never drink blood. You know that? They will never drink blood. So uh, the, the teachings of Roman Catholics where they say uh, the, the wine became blood, transubstantiation, is absolutely wrong. Disciples never understood. None understood that way. This is a wrong teachings of Roman Catholics. Right? And that's the reason you should not be part of that kind of churches. Right? Because it is heresy, actually. All right. But it is symbolic. John chapter 6, verse 53. Remember another one. Uh, there we read. John chapter 6 is usually read by many people I know uh, who are part of these kinds of denominations. There Jesus said, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. Wow. You need to eat. Was Jesus saying that you need to become 
cannibal you know cannibal huh what is cannibalism All right man eating other man's meat that's cannibalism is this a saying you you should eat i mean how, you know it is strange when someone teaches that kind of wrong doctrines right and drinking blood i know the drinking blood here is only part of satan's worship right satan's worship they might drink blood as you know it's not so that's not what friends that's not what christ meant these are sim you know jesus was using it as a symbolically this is the symbolized the idea is that uh, unless okay you eat the flesh drink the blood idea is that unless you are united with me in my death or unless you don't believe in me you cannot be cannot have eternal life that's what jesus said unless you believe in me so when you believe in me you you are identified with my death right you are united with me in my death and burial and resurrection unless you do that you know unless you believe in me no way to have eternal life so it celebrates our union right our continuing union with Christ death lord stable first corinthian chapter 10 now we read paul talks about in the context of idol you know idol worship in the context of eating food that is offered in a temple marketplace and at a home he talks about this one first corinthian chapter 10 verse 16 is it not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks huh he he looks at the cup of thanksgiving right thanksgiving and he says which we give thanks a participation in the blood of christ are we not partaking so uh you know is it not is this cup cup of thanksgiving which we give thanks is it not a symbol of our participation in the blood of christ is it not the bread that we break a participation in the body of christ now look at what i said here yeah we celebrate our union with christ continuously through lord's table union with christ by identifying with his body and blood we are it's not simply it's not simply remembering the death rather you are putting yourselves in jesus place in jesus death that is what actually the idea of memorial it is not simply you remember okay you remember christ dead Christ dead 2000 years ago yeah i i know that no that's not it is much more memorial right this remembering is that you are you are bringing the death of christ alive into your mind when you participate in the lord's table that is what it actually means all right so you celebrate you celebrate the death of christ so first corinthian chapter 11 we read paul says this is important passage about lord's table which often we read in our church um, and there three times paul says do this in remembrance of me right remembrance of me what should you remember you should remember the death of christ let the death of christ you you need to be singing in the what christ had gone through on the cross right so i i i put a uh, note here right i want to do say this a remembrance uh, this is not simply a memory recall then no that is not what it actually means yeah right after, after uh, crucifixion uh, this applies but when he but, had it with his disciples then hmm ha huh, a good question uh, basically saying that he is going to die he is going to die can you rehearse that for us like what 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 was the 
thing he told the disciples? Yes, I was saying, last, yes, huh? in that final supper, because... Last supper. Huh? Yes, the final supper, which is also part of maybe, this was kind of part of, uh, in a Pesach, you know, you know, yes. So where, where um, Jesus says, you know, he broke the bread and mm -hmm. he gave to the disciples and said, and this is mm -hmm. my body. Right, this is my body, and he said, You eat from it. This is my blood. Now, what I was saying, uh, this was a oh, this was a verse against Roman Catholic because they believe that uh, body and blood becomes I mean, sorry, the, the bread and the wine becomes real body of the uh. or body and the blood, mm. right? And I am saying, No. It was symbolic of the coming death of Jesus Christ when he was saying, coming death, the coming death. So he was saying, this is my body. And when he says, this is my body, he was not saying that you are literally eating my flesh. But this, when you partake in this body, you are symbolically being partake in your symbolically being part of my death. Yeah, you are you are sharing in my death. Right? You have a share, you are going to be united. Right? So when you eat, when you drink, and the the reason why I say Lord's table, Lord's table is what we celebrate our continual individual union with Christ by identifying with his blood and his body, right? So uh, we are united with Christ. When we are united with Christ, when Christ died on that cross, we are also dead with Christ, symbolically. And when Christ was buried, we are also buried with him. Symbolically. And when Christ was rose again from the dead, we are also rose again, right? Which is the same as the baptism. Same picture is there. And that same picture is here as well. You and past are... disciples, disciples would not have understood all this when they actually had the last supper with him. Well, they may not, they may not have understood all the significance, but Lay, but when Christ died, yes, when Christ died, they understood it. And that is the reason when John writes, right, when Matthew writes, these are, they're all disciples in a way or the other way, and Paul writes, they all explain it. They understood it very well, right? Understood it very well. What does that mean? Maybe they may not have understood all the significance of the death of Christ, you know, how Christ, after what after ascension, after yeah. ascension, remember, when, remember one more, to... yeah, there's one thing more. When Jesus Christ told them to the disciples, uh, he said, The comforter, the paraclete, the comforter yeah. will come and he will guide you. What? Guide you into all, all truths. He'll guide you into all truths. So that was about writing of the New Testament, right? Holy Spirit will teach them all the significances of what Christ taught here while he was on the earth, on the air, right? So therefore they understood. Peter said, Peter said no. No, you should not die. Well, yeah, because he yeah, didn't so understand. All of, uh, so everything after he ascension and the uh, Holy Spirit given, then they yeah. understood all. I mean, yes, more, you know, in a big way, because death of Christ is the unique incident, so unique in the history, that the significance of the death of Christ and its depth cannot be understood fully even now i'm saying even now even when you go to heaven still you will learn 
more and more about the depth, width of what Christ has done on the cross. It's just very little revealed. And we are grateful for what has been revealed, but you're going to learn. Right? So I'm saying, yes, there are certain things Holy Spirit taught them and they have explained to us. All right. So let me mm -hmm. let me bring it the exegetical notes here, which is very important for us. Remembrance. It is not simply a memory call. Right. When you say, when Paul said, remember Christ's death, it's not a memory recall. It is an observance, a reliving, an internal cogitation on the significance of the events memora, memo, memorialized, right? Memorialized. It is a reliving of Christ's death. It is, it is equal to remember the Sabbath day. You see, the idea when, when God said to Israelites, remember the Sabbath day, is that it simply doesn't mean, okay, you just recall about Sabbath day. No, you observe. You do things, right? So it is an observance, remember means. It is reliving, right, in your mind. In your mind, what had gone, what happened on the cross for our sins. It is like, you know, in Hebrews you read, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. You see? You remember as though, you, you remember means as if you are in prison with them. That's why you remember. So, we have to relieve, that is, renew our union with Christ by reminding ourselves of the cost of the union and our responsibilities in view of that union. So that is what remember means. It's not casual recall. Rather, it is reminding ourselves. Right. So uh, make sure that when you partake in the Lord's table or when you tell people to partake in the Lord's table, make sure that, yes, and they, they remember what Christ has done on the cross and able to, able to understand uh, the, the significance of the events and what is their responsibilities. All right? So that is the importance you know, about, that's the importance about the remembrance. So it's not simply recall. I said first here, here you celebrate his continuing individual union. Number B, I say, believer celebrates his continuing corporate union with the body of Christ, that is, church. It's not only, it is not only through Lord's table you are remembering about Christ's death. Lord's table is not simply for the remembrance of Christ's death. That's how some people think. But if you look at the Bible, Lord's table has more significance. More significance in that it is, it is also you are celebrating on your, you, you, your union with the local church. Communion is more than a memorial merely of the believer's individual union with Christ. It's not simply our union with Christ. It is a celebration of the corporate union of all believers in the body of Christ. It is also a celebration of your unity in the church. Right? That is the primary emphasis in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 70 to 34. So let us look at, let's look at 1 Corinthians here, uh, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 17 onwards. Let's read uh, 17 to 26. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, 
and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. All right, that's, that's enough. So, you understand uh, what Paul's argument. What happens, what happened in, uh, you know, there at Corinthian church, as far as the Lord's table is concerned, they had supper, right? Uh, people were, they had supper. It looks like they were celebrating uh, the death of Christ as they were eating the supper. Now, what was wrong? Some people were coming and eating their own supper. And if you look at that verse, uh, uh, verse 21, you see, as for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. So look at that one. You are eating. You are not waiting for other people. You're eating by yourself. And so what happened? One remains hungry and another gets drunk. The idea is that some eat full, some, do, some don't have. And some gets hungry because they don't have anything. Some are full and even they, some gets drunk. Of course, they're eating bread and wine and they eat so much and people get drunk. Right? I, I mean, this is happening at Corinthian church. And then Paul corrects them, right? Because what? There is no unity in the church, right? It's, it's, not, simply, it's not simply for remembrance of the death. Rather, it also tells the unity of the church, right? That's the reason one of the things you know, we, we would like uh, you know, to have a Lord's table taken place, eating together, together. Which tells a unity. So let's look at some of the theological commentary here. Uh, Paul's concern in this passage is to correct, correct Corinthian error of not partaking of communion in a communal manner. The problem is particularly eg egregious. Paul affirms because so long as they persist in this error, they are not really eating Lord's Supper. Right, because you know this is not Lord's Supper. This remarkable statement stands at the theological center of the meaning of the Lord's Supper. It says, in fact, that a believer cannot legitimately have communion with Christ through the parting, partaking of the bread and wine unless he is simultaneously in communion with the gathered church. Right, if you don't have a proper fellowship with the local church, you cannot really participate in the Lord's table. You cannot have a, you cannot enjoy a communion with Christ because communion with Christ is tantamount to communion with a local church. If your relationship with the local church is wrong, then you are going to be wrong in your communion with Christ because it is connected. It follows then at the exhortation for each man to examine himself. So that's the reason Paul says, examine yourself. It's not primarily to a certain one's vertical relationship. Why this vertical? It is talking about the relationship with God. Not only that, yes, of course, 
your relationship with God is so important, with Christ is so important, but also one should examine his horizontal relationship, that is, relationship with the gathered church there. That should be healthy as well, right? So uh, in order to celebrate Lord's table, you need to have your relationship with Christ important. Second, you need to have a relationship with, with God's people, gathered church is also important. Paul's exhortation for whole church to examine themselves, verse 31, suggests that this is not merely an individual examination. No, rather, it also a mutual examination of the health of the whole church with a sober realization that if necessary, if necessary, excommunication should occur prior to eating. You see? Excommunication. That means if someone is not in relationship with Christ and someone is not in relationship with the gathered church, there is a problem. Look at this verse. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. In your Bible, um, which is very sober warning for everyone. Let's look at that one. First Corinthians 5, 11. Can one of you please read? But now I'm writing to, to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler, do not even eat with such people. Yes, do not even eat with such people. I, I take it as partake in Lord's table because it is Paul is writing about what is going on in the church, Corinthian church, and, the, you know, and it is the same thing that is connected. Uh, chapter 5, chapter 10, chapter 11, same, same thing Paul argues. And he says, do not even eat with such a people. The idea is that should not should not have serve, should not serve Lord's table with them. So that is that clearly says two relationship is very important. The relationship with Christ of a believer is very important, right? Number two, relationship with other people are also important in, as a qualification for partaking in Lord's table. So when when Paul says in chapter 5, verse 11, he says, I'm writing you that you must not associate with a so-called brother, right? Who calls himself a brother, should not associate with him. That means the idea is that someone claims to be a believer who is part of a local church. Now he becomes sexually immoral, right? Sexually immoral. He's greedy. He's an idolater, slanderer, drunk god, swindler. Uh, that is what makes a person, but he claims to be uh, a member of a church. You should not associate. The idea is there should be excommunication. You should remove him from the church membership. So if you want to remove him from the church membership, that means your church should have a membership register. If it is a biblical church. I know that some churches do not have, which is... Uh, which is, again, a thing to uh, consider, right? Do you have a membership? Do you have a membership role? Do you have a membership removal process? Uh, those things are to be uh, really looked at here. So uh, Lord's table is very important. You cannot serve Lord's table to anyone if that is what some people think. No, you cannot. And for this reason... Uh, the Baptist church is traditionally viewed the table in connection with the church discipline as a primary means whereby church maintain its purity and unity. Yes. Church maintains its unity and purity through Lord's table. Through Lord's table. So that's very, very important here. All right. So we looked at the meaning. Understand two things. Number one, our union with Christ's death, right, through Lord's table. But we will be wrong if simply we focus only that. Lord's table also declares 
our union with the gathered church, right? And Paul says, yes, you should partake in a communal manner. So um, that means, that means God, God invites every true believer who are part of the local church to partake in Lord's table. So it is not right because I've seen in certain churches, some people say, and I'm not going to partake in Lord's table today. All right, they're very free to do. No, uh, some people do that, which is wrong. God asks us to observe. That means everyone should observe. It is not right abstaining from Lord's table, right? Because when one abstains from Lord's table, that tells a serious sin is in view, right? That For that, church should uh, inquire and talk about it, right? It's not easy. It's not easy to simply abstain because I've seen some people think it is very easy for them. No, it is a sin. It is a sin to abstain. There are two plays, right? Uh, one is if someone doesn't observe Lord's table uh, in a gathered church, it is a sin. But same time, one has to examine himself before he observes Lord's table. That means if there is sin. So there are necessary things to be done before partaking in Lord's table. So that is also important in Lord's view. Because of what Jesus is looking at is purity in the gathered local church.